Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 322 of The Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Jeremy Green. Hello. And Kai Davis. Hey there, folks. And Eric Dietrich. Hey, everyone. And I'm Ruben Lerner. And this week, we are going to talk about how to raise prices, or as we put in the title, raising prices without raising eyebrows or raising fists or raising ire or any other thing that fits the metaphor. Uh, Kai, you suggested this topic. Why don't you uh, bring us into it? Absolutely. Let me just slam my cup of coffee. So uh, I think one of the critical things in any freelancing or consulting business is to obviously be raising your prices. And there's a number of factors that could go into when you should raise your prices. And we'll get into that into the meat of the call. But I think just like if you're tuning into this episode for the first 90 seconds, take away this one key point. Every quarter or so, you should look at your prices, see if there's an opportunity to charge more, and then raise your prices. Make this a quarterly habit just so you're continually saying, am I providing more value? If so, let me raise that price so it's in line with the value I'm providing. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Okay, so so let me let me challenge you on on that in at least one one place and we'll see where we go from there so Mm -hmm. you say you should always be raising your prices or even like every quarter Mm -hmm. how how do you like how do you know you should be raising prices how do you get a feeling like or or should it just be an automatic thing like every quarter every half year yeah i should just go and raise my prices like what what signs should you get should you have that it's time to do that I think like the answer is both categories. Like it should be a habitual process. So every quarter or every half year you are entering this sort of check stage and saying, oh, is it time for me to raise my prices? But more quantifiable, concrete things, I think, tie into authority or tie into signals of expertise. So it might be something like you just collected a wonderful case study from a, cu- from a customer that shows great outcomes that you're able to provide or great outcomes that they experienced. You just gave a talk at a conference. You just self-published a book on a uh, topic relating to the service. Any of these moves that signal, hey, I'm more of an authority on this topic, I'm more of an expert, even things like, oh, the last five proposals I sent out for this service, they all closed without any objections. All of these are excellent signs that you could look for throughout the year and say, oh, yeah, you know, I just gave that talk. Let me charge more because I have a better uh, perceived reputation of authority and expertise in this area. Or, hey, my proposals keep closing. Let me raise that price and see if I start getting some price pushback. If not, maybe I'm making an extra 500 or 5000 per proposal just by testing the waters and seeing if I could move that price up. So that's an interesting point already, like that basically – you should keep – like if, if people are happy with your prices, if they're not complaining, then you might be charging too little. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We could take that in an interesting direction where people are always afraid of objections on proposals or sales calls or in any sort of sales context since they think an objection means no and this is the reason why. But an objection really means yes and if you could figure out you know, this one detail, we'll have a great deal. So if you aren't getting objections around your pricing – there's definitely an opportunity to raise your prices and see, does that start to service objections? Is there an opportunity to then further improve the service by solving those objections and virtuous cycle time, we could then again raise the prices? Okay. Okay. That I like, I, I basically agree with that. Cause it's true. Like if people are, sort of, if people are saying to me, Oh, okay, that's fine. No, we'll pay that. Then I think, Hmm, <laughs> that mm-hmm. was too easy. But, but if I get pushback from people saying, really, you want to charge that much? Um, and if, if I uh, also like back when I started consulting, I would uh, be a real pushover. Um, mm-hmm. And so they would say, that's really very expensive. Can't you cut that? I'd say, OK, fine, let's cut that. Um, and now, actually, I'm much tougher about it. And in most cases, not all, but most cases, they accept it. They're like, oh, really? That's what you charge? You're not going to go down? Fine. 
we'll 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 go with it. Um, I mean, I mentioned I mentioned on the podcast that like in Israel, it's very typical to get a call from the purchasing department, which is really the we must get a discount to approve this deal department. <laughs> and so, like, but I, I've given them like preposterously do, low discounts. Basically, they they sometimes like one time they begged me. They were like, "Listen, we can't approve this deal unless you discount it a little bit." So I think uh-huh. I like discounted it by something like twenty dollars a day or fifty dollars a day. And they said, OK, that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and so like as long as they were able to go back to their bosses. But um, similarly, I had a client recently say, listen, we're having some budget problems. We can only go ahead with these courses if you cut the price in half or if you not maybe in half, but like if you give us a big discount. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, like I'd rather lose the work instead of doing that. And I do a lot of work with this company. I decided mm-hmm. better not to do that because it'll set a bad precedent. But the precedents mm-hmm. can be set in the other direction, too, of, OK, you're high priced but you're worth it and they know it and they'll come back to you. Yes. Yes. And I think there's one word you used uh, early on there that I want to pick up on uh, uh, how early on as a consultant, you felt you were a bit of a pushover. And I think a lot of the pricing advice and a lot of like the tactical or strategic things we share on this call or are out there in the freelancer and consultant ecosystem really comes down to feeling confident in your prices. Alan Weiss has that wonderful saying, uh, the first sale is to yourself. If you're able to quote yourself like that crazy high price, you're going to go into that meeting with confidence. And if you have that self-confidence, people aren't going to push back as hard or won't push back and say, yeah, knock it down by 50 percent. You're going to come forward with a number that feels right, is right, and you're communicating as the correct price for this value of service. So for me, one thing, I don't know that I've made a point of developing a concrete policy on this, but I don't negotiate on price. And I of the opinion that that has helped me with that confidence. It's, you know, almost transactional in the sense that even whether I'm quoting some kind of um, custom consulting thing or, um, you know, quoting uh, our standard prices for the um, content business that I have, it's just, this is the price. And either you want that price or not. It's not that I wouldn't negotiate about anything, but if, if it were, you know, if I quoted 50K for some kind of um, custom consulting project and they came back and said our budget is 30K, it would be not that I'll do the 50K thing for 30K, but OK, let's retool and I'll tell you what I would do for 30K. Um, so that is in a lot of ways made my life easier over the last several years is just that, you, you know, going into the conversation, knowing that um, if I quote X and a somebody says, Hey, can you give me a 5% discount? No, I don't do that. I like that approach a lot. And like it ties into the idea that no is a full sentence. If somebody asks for a discount, you're entirely entitled to say, no, I don't do that. Or just no. Right. Again, again, it can be a very cultural thing. Like, I mean, in Mm -hmm. Israel, as I've said, like some companies simply will not accept no for an answer on the discounting, but Mm -hmm. you can reduce it to such a laughable degree that they get to check off the box that like they needed to show their boss and you can sort of, you know, say, say it's silly mm-hmm. um, or just, you know, be- better to get, you know, almost all the money than, you know, none of the money at all. Um, I definitely have found that uh, American and European companies tend to be, uh, well, they tend to pay more for consulting. And um, t- I don't know, my experience is like pe- people, at least in the productized consulting thing, like courses, they don't tend to negotiate very much on that. Like they'll never... I haven't had any clients there say, oh, really? Well, we need to reduce that by X percent. It's either a yes or no. I think it's worth mentioning that, uh, you know, so far we have really only used the word price and not the word rates. And that that is a very important but subtle distinction. Um, And if you have a price for something that that really sort of implies that you are charging a fixed fee you know, probably based on the value that you are delivering to the client for some desired business outcome versus if you're charging rates like hourly or weekly, you don't really have as much of a defined outcome. You just are agreeing that, okay, I will work for you for a while. And when you have separated the your time inputs from the value that you're delivering, that really frees you up a lot to raise prices in a way that it's hard to raise rates. That is a great point because if I think about the content business that we have and if we raise prices on a service, 
versus if we were looking at that as that we were like a labor-based agency that had rates. My experience is that when you raise prices, you can kind of easily say, if questioned about that, well, we've done some internal analysis about our own costs, and this is just what makes sense from a business perspective, versus it feels like if you're raising rates, that you have a harder time claiming any kind of internal intellectual property, I guess, um, or internal procedures and best practices and thus costs. So you're right. It is a very subtle distinction, but it's an important one because prices implies that you have some kind of internal stuff going on. Rates implies that it's just labor. And so when you go to somebody and you say, I'm going to raise my rate on you, um, they're going to look at that as being kind of all about them in a way. How do you justify this? You're going to charge me more when you're doing the same thing versus raising prices you can justify that by citing your own internal business operations. So I think that is a huge distinction. Yeah. And you'll find companies that have a hard ceiling on rates that they are willing to pay. You know, if they're calculating an hourly rate, you know, there are plenty of people that just, you know, full stop will not pay $300 an hour, no matter what it is that they're having done. But those very same people, you know, won't blink at, Oh, twenty thousand dollar flat fee for X business outcome, um, and it's just you know kind of a weird internal politics thing that you get into there, uh, and so just that mm-hmm. distinction between prices and rates is very important to keep in mind as you try to make more money for yourself. That is an excellent, excellent point. The the one small thing I'd add on to it is I, uh, there's also the value component. Mm-hmm. The way I usually think of it is value, price, and cost, and cost would be equivalent to rate here, where the value is really what the client sees it as being worth. The price is what we're charging, and the rate or our cost is how much it costs us to actually do the thing. And that space between value and price, that's really where we get to play in when we're raising the price on something, saying, okay, the client values this at, just to use round numbers, $100,000. I've been charging 10000 I'm now going to charge 20000 for it, because we could see the value greatly outweighs the price here. Even if we aren't using value-based pricing or value-based anchoring, just understanding where the value is for the client could help us understand where we can increase that price or add on new elements to our service that justify a price increase. Right, that's also important that as you work with a client for longer, and not all gigs are long-term, but I've had a few clients over the years where I worked with them for literally years and I got to know their business as well and their needs well, and so, it made sense to raise my 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 rates because um, I was offering more value. I was helping their businesses grow more, and they also needed to babysit me less, right? They didn't need to explain to me all the things they were doing. It was very obvious, and so they had to spend less time telling me what to do and and you know describing the problems that I needed to solve. So when yep. you um when you went about having those raise the rate conversations, how did that go with those really long-standing clients? Um, so I usually waited to do it for a while and I would explain, look, you know, we've been working together for a while. Uh, so, so first of all, let, let me just, uh, my strategy on raising rates is generally do it first for like six months or a year to all new clients. And that's a way of, kicking the tires, making sure that the rate is not too crazy. Um, And so actually I'll give different new clients different new rates to see how far I can push it before they start screaming at me and like, no, we're not going to do that. (laughs) Um, Then I sort of, you know, make make everyone more or less equal um, in terms of the rates. Then after that six months or a year, I go to my old clients and my existing clients. I say, look, you are the last people paying these old rates. Other people have been paying these for a year already. I held that as long as I could, but um, you know I'm offering a lot of value, and um, uh, the time has come to raise things. Now that's true with training, with the consulting slash development work that I was doing, especially one client where we raised rates. I guess it was already two years ago now, um, where basically I said, look, we as I sort of mentioned here, we're really familiar with the product. We know what's going on. You understand our work is going really well. It was both me and uh, my employee who does development. And uh, we raised the rates quite a bit. And we had a bit of a negotiation over how much they could afford and, and what would be worth it. And I don't think I was brilliant at negotiating it, but it definitely was an increase. And I was happy. My employee was very, very happy. Uh, and the client has kept us on since then. And so I think every, you know, 
to use a, a phrase which I really hate, it was quite the win-win. Um, but but it definitely helps, I would say, in negotiation to say, um, I've waited as long as I can because I value you as a client. It's only now that like, you don't want to be the last one. You, you don't want to be the one paying the lowest amount, do you? And they realize then, uh-oh, <laughs> right? If I'm paying less than everyone else, then I'm less of a priority than everyone else and or other people are more attractive in terms of work. I better catch up. I love that tactic of uh, uh, raising the rates on the new clients for that six to 12 month period and then circling back with the existing clients. It's such a nice way to A, test that these prices work and B, have that social proof of these other people are paying these rates. Would you like to as well? And just like <laughs> gently move them forward rather than the P.S. My rates are going up by 40 percent next week. Pleasure working with you. Invoices in the mail. The drip approach. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've found too, just from a tactical perspective, when you have that conversation and Reuven, I actually do something pretty similar when it comes to raising the prices that we have in the content business where we'll do it for new clients first with a grandfathering period for the old one. But um, when it comes time to have that conversation with the old ones, usually I, if possible, I try to wait till there's a moment where we've delivered some kind of win or where there's been a visible success just in terms of the timing, you know, whether that's some kind of kind words or, um, you know, whatever the case may be, some kind of demonstrable increase in a KPI. Um, uh, not, you know, it wouldn't be a deal breaker not to have that, but that's a great time where you can have this back and forth where they're saying, yeah, you know, I'm getting some real value here. And, and you can kind of transition into saying, I'm glad to hear that. Here's the thing, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're kind of using the the momentum of their goodwill towards you to help push that conversation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and sometimes I'll um, tee up a conversation like that by asking them, you know, how do you think this is going? Because if they come back and they say, well, you know, it's just kind of marginal, like um, – Mm. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with what I'm spending. I'm not sure I'd want to spend more or something, you know, where they're on the fence, then it's, it's worth thinking on their behalf. Um, are they getting enough value to justify this? So if my cost is such that I need to raise my rates and they're not getting enough value out of it, it might be that this isn't a fit or, mm -hmm. you know, we might need to look at retooling the relationship a little so we can get them a little more value and then revisit the conversation. So I think an important thing uh, for me when it comes to raising prices is to make sure as I'm doing so that it isn't just about me and I'm evaluating what's in the best interest of this client. And it may be that um, our situation has changed such that we're no longer a fit and that's okay, but I wanna be bearing in mind what they need. I like that approach and you're right. In the end, it all comes down to what is best for the client. And it seems odd as I say that out loud, like within an episode of pricing to talk about what's best for the client. But really, if we think about it, like. If somebody new comes along and says, Eric, I would love to work with you. I want to pay you twice your top billing client. Well, the bottom billing client most likely will get fired at some point down the line because we have new clients coming in that want to pay more. So in a sense, raising prices and having conversations with our clients to say, hey, you're getting value out of this. The price is going to go up. Let's figure out what that looks like if we continue working together, if we transition in a different direction. It allows you to approach it in a much more kind way and allows it to be a conversation rather than a, here it is, let's move forward. Yeah, I, exactly. And I've actually found um, one of the kind of uh, pieces of reasoning that's evolved here that makes me see it this way is often if I'm at the top end of a client's price range to the point where they're uncomfortable and they're at the bottom end of what I would want to do business for, that can be a relationship that has, you know, friction for both parties and could lead to resentment. So when it's a price raising conversation, if it's a client that's pretty resistant to that, you're sort of pushing that envelope. And I've actually found at times where I've amicably parted ways with clients in that situation. And it's almost like this relief of pressure where both parties, you know, kind of see, hey, you know, this at one time was a fit, but maybe it isn't at this point. Our budget isn't high enough uh, for what you charge. And for us, it's not, you know, worth doing the business. Um, and as long as your business is prepared uh, to handle that, it can actually be kind of a nice conversation, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a huge emotional relief. Yeah. And and to that point about, you know, pricing being good for the client, um, it's counterintuitive, but high rates 
or prices really do tend to signal value to clients and help it be more likely that they will take your advice. Um, and it, I know that that sounds weird, but you can think about it. I, I think this is an example that I heard Patrick McKenzie give one time. He said, you know, a CEO never goes to his people and says, hey, I got this consultant for dirt cheap. He was such a bargain. Listen to him, do everything he says. You know, th that's not the way that works. It goes in and he says, I am paying so much money for these people. They know their stuff. Listen to them. Do what they say. Uh, and so, you know, if you think about it through that lens, like raising your price makes it more likely that clients will take your advice. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. took me a long time to get my head wrapped around that. And it won't yeah, always happen. It won't happen with all the clients. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. There will be some clients who will be like, wow, that's way too much. Forget it. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. You Like, regardless of how you're charging them, you don't want to constantly have this feeling of bitterness from your client. Oh, my God, I'm paying so much. <laughs> like, you mm -hmm. want to have a sense of, yeah, I'm paying. I, whatever I'm paying, I'm getting more out of it than I'm putting into it. And so if you have these super, super price sensitive, otherwise known as cheap clients, um, then that can be more stress than it's worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say, um, kind of tagging onto the theme here, like of this conversation, my recommendation would be if you if you are having these conversations about raising price, and I'm trying to think if I would if this would be universal um, or if I can think of exceptions, but I think near universal anyway would be if you're having that conversation, you should be prepared for that client to say no, I don't agree to that price, and then to walk away from it if they don't, because if you're just kind of throwing it out there in the hopes that they'll say yes, I think you're gonna potentially struggle. So I. If you are making this decision from a business perspective to raise prices or rates, um, I think that you should be prepared to, you know, kind of go full bore into that and raise them in such a way that um, you're comfortable you can get more business at the higher rate if you needed to, and that you don't need that client at the bottom that you're cutting off unless they do come along with you. Because I think it would probably not bode well for the relationship if you said, I'm raising my rates, and they said, ah, no, we don't want to pay anymore, and you just said, well, okay. Uh, that seems like an awkward position to be in to me. Six months later, hey, I'm raising my rates. Didn't we go through this once before? No. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you're lowering them this time, my consultant friend. I mean, I just, I just sort of uh, um, uh, looked up in, in my email, and yeah, it was about a year ago that uh, with that I guess I went through sort of the latest round of raising prices. And so I guess it was two years ago that I started like raising my prices and do the whole thing that I described. Um, and, and this big company that I work with basically said, that's fine. We understand people, you know, our suppliers raise prices on us every so often, just like don't do it too often. And I think they even said like, don't, you know, let's wait two years until raising them again. So they can justify to their bosses because they need to do that. You know, okay, such and such a supplier is raising rates by 10%, 20%, but they haven't done it in two years, so we understand that. Um, mm -hmm. Because, I mean, there is, even if, remember, if you don't raise your rates at all, um, ignore everything else, then, like, inflation, which is so high nowadays, but it is eating into what you're getting. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so you do want to, like, you do need to sort of at least keep even with inflation to, to avoid losing money from year to year. Another thing that occurs to me just on the subject of raising prices is <clears throat> something we haven't talked about much so far is raising prices, I guess, on the basis of analyzing your best business or maybe raising prices for services you're not as interested in providing. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting subject. Like I have, I'm of two minds on this almost. Um, raising prices on things you maybe want to get out of the business of doing or, or what have you can be a great way to let the market make decisions for you. <laughs> but I have also been in situations where I've raised rates substantially on, on things that I was doing that I wanted to get out of the business of, and then clients say yes. And that can actually be not the best <laughs> because you're <laughs> totally obligated to do it. It's hard to justify to yourself. You're making a lot of money for it, but like you, you kind of raise the prices 
in the hopes of not doing it. And now you're doing it anyway. So that's, uh, I don't have a great universal answer for that, but it's a dynamic to be aware of. If you're raising prices or rates because you don't want to do something, think about what'll happen if the client says yes anyway. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, I would say this is not a great way to manage a client from hell. Yeah. I've thought about doing that on occasion of saying, because for example, uh, I used to teach Ruby classes on a regular basis and now it's like once every 18 months, someone will ask me about it. And it's just a ton of work to go and make sure the course is updated and it's kind of rusty and so forth. So I've occasionally thought about saying, okay, well, the price for that is just going to be sky high. And I said, you know what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just don't want to do it. And so I just took it off of my website. And suddenly people don't call and suddenly, right? Suddenly once every 18 months, <laughs> if you can call that suddenly, people don't call me about it anymore. Um so, so yeah, like you can add price. I know some people add uh, to pricing for rush jobs or for working on weekends and so forth. It's like they're, they're gonna they're gonna transmit the pain that they're feeling to the client and force it to be, you know, force it to be more expensive. Mm-hmm. But it might just be easier to say no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and with things like that, that's that's a, a great example. Like I'll charge more if you're gonna have me work on the weekends. Some clients, especially with fairly large you know, monetary war chests will just take that as I've bought your weekend and I will not hesitate to use it. So <laughs> careful what you sell. So in a sense, in a way, a lot of these pricing aspects come down to boundaries and expectation setting with the client. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and I think Go that's a, a good lead in to a, another way that you can raise your prices. And that is to get better at managing those expectations that clients have and be more deliberate about what expectations you set and, Mm -hmm. and uh, being different in how you making a change in how you sell what you do versus necessarily changing what you do. Uh, And I think the best example that I know of this is uh, maybe Nick D Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's a designer by trade and training uh, but he doesn't sell himself as a designer. He sells conversion rate optimization services in which he uses his design shops to help e-commerce companies increase their conversion rates. And by focusing on that, he's able to charge a lot more for the use of his design skills than he would be if he just went in and said, hey, I'm a designer and I'll make your homepage prettier. Completely agreed. In a sense, it's like identifying the skills you have that form the foundation of your service offering, identifying the actual expensive problem that your target client wants to spend money on and figuring out how you bridge that gap. Okay, what do I need to learn to take my, you know, level 10 designer skills and get good enough at CRO to be able to start providing that as a service to the client? Yep. You know, this um, reminded me of another kind of creative way. I guess this isn't technically raising prices, but a creative way, I guess, to bill more um, if it, it, that has to do with boundaries, which is, um, and I'm trying to think of an off-the-cuff example, but let's say you went around building out um, websites for small companies, and routinely as part of that, they said, oh, uh, well, aren't you going to set us up with Google Analytics or something that would be sort of a gray area in scope? If that becomes enough of a friction point or a boundary point for you, you can actually say like, hey, you go and put up on your website that there's this um, additional surcharge or additional offering for Google Analytics. And then you can turn around and say, well, I will do that for you, but um, this is a separate offering that I have. So if you find that there's a way that these kind of gray areas around boundaries are being violated in your mind, uh, pricing it out as a separate offering can, can really help a lot. Strong, strong agreement. Yeah. And for anybody that feels any resistance to that, think about the last time you had an electrician or a repair person over to your house and you were like, hey, while you're dealing with the dishwasher, can you also take a look at, you know, the uh, refrigerator? They'll say, sure, it'll be an extra X dollars an hour to do that. It's very, very normal when you try to increase the scope or the scope increases to say, yes, I can do that. There will be an additional charge. Do you want to move forward with that? Yeah, I love that idea, Eric, or that concept of the things that clients are asking for that aren't strongly defined within your service offering, those could easily become new service offerings. That's one of the ways I went from website SEO audits to link building because people kept saying, okay, this audit is great. What do I need to do to build links? And suddenly I realized, oh, hey, 
the market's literally asking for a new service offering. Now I could add this, price it out, bundle it in, and move on forward with it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you keep hearing you know, the same thing over and over, you know, can you do this for me extra? Or I thought X was included in your normal offering. If that becomes a theme, you know, you're looking at a, a pretty good line of business there potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that I'd like to mention uh, is ways to give yourself kind of an effective raise, even if you aren't actually charging your clients more. Uh, and Kai, I think you just mentioned a, an example that might be pretty good for this, you know, doing uh, SEO audits and mm -hmm. things like that, where you're basically providing reports for people. Um, you know, if you have a flat fee that you're charging for that, and then you can find ways to automate that work or mm -hmm. speed it up, or you know, anything you can do so that your investment in getting that deliverable out the door is less you're effectively giving yourself a raise on that. You know, if you look at your effective hourly rate, if it used to take you two hours and now it takes you one hour, but you're still charging the same money for it, you've effectively doubled your rate uh, and you're giving yourself more time to do whatever it is that you want to do, whether that's work on your business, take time off to be with your family, you know, go biking, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think the the real thing at the core of wanting to be able to raise your prices is being able to get some freedom to do other things and not have to be working all the time. And if you can just automate some of that away, you can effectively give yourself a raise without having to raise the eyebrows of your clients by asking them to pay you more. Brilliant point. Brilliant, brilliant point. I love it. I think that that's one of the reasons that I moved over to a uh, uh, package service or fixed price or productized service billing just because mm -hmm. when I was billing hourly, I mean, it's the, the obvious uh, contradiction that Jonathan Stark has pointed out. As I get more efficient, I'm suddenly earning less. That doesn't make sense. I'm better at the thing. Yeah. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as he points out also, there's a ceiling as to how much you can charge per hour. Like, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm now five times better than I was when I was charging $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. are, are people willing to pay $500 an hour for software development? No, probably not. Or if or if they are, um, I'd, I'd like to be introduced to them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you need to then price it out in a different way. And um, yeah, yeah, so you shouldn't be penalized for that. And getting closer to the business goals is one major way to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good kind of like philosophical point here is that for anyone listening, you know, whether you're doing um, application development or kind of niche application development or even some kind of management consulting, whatever it may be, beyond a certain point, if you want to raise your prices, you will have to find a different way to bill because there's for any hourly thing or even, you know, daily or weekly thing, there is going to be a cap on what organizations will pay. So even if you haven't hit that cap yet, at some point you will. And then if you want to raise prices, you're going to have to find a different way to charge for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've often found a lot of luck in, or not luck, I've often seen a lot of success in adding in, we might have touched on this before, but I think it bears repeating if we did, uh, adding in bonuses or other deliverables that aren't tied to time. And it might be something that, you know, I created it once, I need to Mad Libs in the right names for the company and the people, and then I could deliver it to them. And it still provides value. It doesn't require me to do the same, say, two to five hours of work to generate that report each time. Mm -hmm. So I find adding in those types of things where it still might provide value for the client. Hey, here's a three month timeline of what to do for your own SEO moving forward. I could charge more for my service. Now the client feels like there's more value and we've shifted away from a pure, okay, you're putting X hours into this model to I'm putting in X hours and you're getting these additional deliverables. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. And honestly, I, I'm going to put in a plug for Remark for this. Remark has been my secret weapon at doing this, <laughs> being able to turn Mark down into a beautiful report for a client. It's a huge level up. Excellent. Love <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> um, so how, how I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you guys approach clients? Like, I found when it comes to raising rates, um, I mean, I do a lot of communication via email with my clients, but raising rates is something I want to do on the phone. I mean, I, I typically don't live in the same place as many of my clients um, or the people who make these decisions. 
But it's not the sort of thing where I just want to zip off an email and say, hey, by the way, sometimes there's sort of no choice. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like the personal voice approach can soften the blow a little bit. Um, am I alone in this? Uh, for me, what I've taken to doing is kind of a phased approach, if you will. The first way I broach the subject is usually via an email or some asynchronous communication, and it's a very soft mention. I don't mention any specific new prices or anything. It's just a, hey, don't know if you realize this or not, but we changed our rate structure quite a while back. Um, we've grandfathered you in at the rate that you were on. We haven't worked out all the details yet, but you know, starting in June or something, we're going to be bringing everyone up to current. I will let you know later when we know more, but um, I just wanted to give you as much advance notice as possible. So sometimes the client from there is very receptive or just, you know, okay, fair enough. And then it almost doesn't require a, a conversation like that. Other times, you know, if, if they talk about being worried about their budget or something, then that's when it's let's have a call and kind of see what makes sense for both of us here. Um, so that's been my approach that I've kind of settled into. Ditto. I like that a lot. Uh, I usually move towards call or face-to-face -face communication if I can have it. And I'll start off, and Eric, you used this question earlier on, and it's something that I find to be useful in these sort of price expectation resetting conversations. Uh, how do you think our work together is going? Just to start off on that foot of, hey, are they enjoying it? Are they not enjoying it? Are they angry? Are they not angry about it? And moving forward from there into, okay, great, you enjoy it. I, I, this is how we're evolving or this is how our agency is growing. So starting from that point of assessing, like, how do you feel about this? And if it's positive, moving into, okay, great, let's reset expectations around price. Yeah, I mean, because if, if the answer to that is I'm not sure about how this is going or I don't feel good about it, that's a client that may not keep going anyway, uh, yeah. even at the same rate, let alone go through the raised rates. Mm -hmm. So then you're kind of mm -hmm. having a different conversation like, well, um, what's going wrong and does it even make sense for us to continue working together? Cause we're actually going to be raising price. Um, mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, and then maybe you're having a discussion like, Hey, if it's, even if it's not me or if it's not us helping you, let's talk about your needs. Cause I may have some recommendations for you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think it's a great way to put yourself to, to use the overused expression on the same side of the table as a client. Since then it's a conversation mm -hmm. about how do we move forward? Uh, uh, what's the right next step here rather than I'm raising my prices and it's a confrontation. Yeah. Thinking about other ways raising prices without raising eyebrows. I honestly think like the two big takeaways for me are having it scheduled on your calendar and just having it at least as a regularly timed thought experiment. Have I done enough recently to raise my prices and nudging yourself in that direction and encouraging yourself to have conversations with clients around how do you think this project is going? That's another sort of qualitative uh, uh, sign of it's time to raise your rates. If you talk to all your clients and they're like, it's wonderful. The return on investment is out of, uh, out of our expectations. It's beautiful. Definitely move towards charging more. You are delivering great results. Yeah, definitely. And I would say whether it's internally or externally or both that you can justify it. Um, as long mm -hmm. as you've done this thought experiment and you feel good about raising rates, you know, approach that with confidence. It's nothing to uh, be unsure about or nervous about how it's going to be taken. And I mean, obviously if you have a call with a client and say, I'm going to raise my rates, the thing that you want to happen is them, them to say, okay, that's great. Let's do it. And the thing you don't want to happen is for them to dig in and say, no, I won't. But mm -hmm. if, you are delivering value and you're justified and they're not going to come along. That's okay because you're going to be able to get other business at the new rates and you're just kind of um, then eliminating a piece of business that over the long run isn't going to be a fit for you. Great point. In a badass, your brand, Pia Sylvia makes a similar point where if you're attracting a certain type of clients, that's just going to attract more of that same type of client. So if you start having these conversations and identify the clients who are resistant to the price raising or who just aren't a good fit, if you eliminate them from your business, you're going to be left with more clients who are in line with what you want, and they're more likely to give you referrals to more businesses similar to them. So it's, again, a nice virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, one, one last question that I have is, how much do you raise your rates? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. I've always taken sort of the, since I really like the package service, productized service approach, I've usually taken to stair-stepping it up by $500 or so once I have that series of wins or so. Uh, uh, 
but that's a one-off one-time service. So I'll stair-step it up there. If it's a recurring service, I'll also stair-step it up very much following Eric's approach where we raise it for new prices or new clients. And then we circle back to the existing clients after a while and say, hey, this is the new rate. Do you want to move up to it? But uh, uh, that's my approach. I think it's really, really sort of like smash rocks together to see what happens. I'm very curious what you all do. <laughs> so I can give yeah. two like very different answers. Um, for the management consulting that I was doing, that was pretty easy because uh, more and more that became things that I do for one to three weeks, quick hitter type engagements. Um, so to you know when those are happening in sequence, if I've been getting um, good you know inbound business, I could just say, well, you know I'm gonna increase the rate for this two week thing by five thousand dollars or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so that was pretty easy to do because I didn't have long term episodic kind of uh, engagements. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum with our content agency, which has website uh, a website containing prices and stuff, that more and more raising the price of things that we offer has become sort of a factor of looking at internal margins and efficiency and cost. So now I actually have um, spreadsheets that detail what our service delivery costs, what kind of margins we would earn on that, et cetera. <clears throat> so that becomes much more of a numbers game and less of a gut feel kind of thing. Um, so for me, I guess I, I've had like very opposite experiences in how to go about doing that. I suppose that's an excellent point to make. Like there's no one true path here. The outcome of you should be charging more for your work is something we all should be striving for. But we've, con we've gone through a number of different strategic and tactical implementations of how to raise it in these different scenarios. I mean, I, I just want to pause for a second and call that out as being something valuable for the listeners to observe. There's a number of paths to do this. It's important to figure out what works for your target market, your business, and the way you enjoy approaching it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Answer. Maybe uh, we should wrap up and move to picks. Any other, any other quick comments before we do that? All right. So, uh, Eric, what you got in terms of picks for this week? So this conversation reminded me of a book, and I hope I get the title right. I listened to it on audiobook, and I think it's called The Pumpkin Plan. I'll get the right link to the book in, or Pumpkin Entrepreneur. And this was a really interesting book that was oriented around the idea of looking at all of your clients and kind of picking the best ones based on a methodical scheme and applying the 80-20 principle. But uh, as part of the collateral associated with this book, the author, whose name escapes me at the moment, actually provided like a spreadsheet template that you can download from his website. So you wind up listing the clients um, and uh, the... Uh, revenues you're earning from them, like sorting by the revenues, and then kind of rating them in all these different ways. And it paints a picture of your best clients. And I mean, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but the idea is basically figure out who your best and worst clients are, and then actively look to call the worst while figuring out how to get more of the best. And um, the conversation here fits into that, I think, pretty nicely, simply because um, raising rates, you know, uh, finding good clients. One of the core <laughs> ideas there is uh, finding clients that will happily see value in what you're doing and pay your rates. So um, there's that. And I'll throw a pick out, um, which I do occasionally to writing for hit subscribe. If you want to write technical blog posts, how to's, that sort of thing. Uh, that is what we do for our clients. So if that is of interest to you, I will throw in a link to our apply to write for us page. Excellent. Uh, Jeremy, what picks do you have for us? Uh, so my first one is a blog post by Patrick McKinsey called Don't Call Yourself a Programmer and Other Career Advice. Uh, and in it, he talks a lot about the idea of separating what you do from your for your clients from how you talk about what you do and how you sell what you do. And it's about, you know, don't call yourself a programmer. Tell them that, you know, you can help their business. Um, and it's about, you know, tying yourself closer to the profits than to costs. Uh, it's a really good one. Uh, I recommend it a lot. And then my second one is a self-promotional pick that uh, Kai mentioned earlier, uh, remark.io. Uh, it's great for templatized uh, proposals, reports, uh, all that kind of thing. You can also write books. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that. Remark with the Q, by the way. <laughs> Is there another way to spell it, please? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kai, what you got for us? Absolutely. So today it's a pick of a book. Uh, I just want to call out 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall. Uh, the subtitle is The Definitive Guide to Working Less and Making More. It's an excellent book approaching uh, uh, how to uh, essentially what we have talked about on this conversation, like identify your most profitable segment of your customers, figure out how to double down on them. If you identify that, oh, hey, you know, a large percentage of my customers are excited to pay for this thousand dollar service. That gives you an indication that, well, there's probably a smaller group who would be excited to pay for a $5,000 or a $10,000 service. <clears throat> this is definitely one of the books that was most transformational for me in my approach to marketing in 2018 and now in 2019. So strong recommendation for 80-20 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall. Wow, that sounds great. All right, and I've got uh, three picks this week. So um – uh, let's see, I recommended already a podcast called Slow Burn, and there were two series of it. And the first season was all about Watergate and sort of going through Watergate. And you sort of hear here and there about, oh, yes, and before Nixon resigned and so forth, and before the whole Watergate scandal hit full force, that um, Spiro Agnew, his vice president, resigned and he had a scandal. So there is an absolutely amazing podcast Um from uh, I'm uh, Rachel, I can't remember her, her last name from MSNBC. Um, anyway, someone else can remember. Maybe called Bagman, and oh my God, it is so amazing! It is oh Rachel Rachel Maddow, and basically it's the same sort of thing as Slow Burn. But if you thought that Spiro Agnew resigned from being vice president of the U.S. because um, he was involved in Watergate, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it is like so incredible and amazing to hear the history there and uh it's really really fun interesting and well done and i i like binge listen to it if there is such a thing um two other picks are self-promotional um one of them is after a long time of talking about it i finally launched my podcast about training which i call train better and uh, so I have a link to it, and I am hopefully going to be interviewing lots of people who do training at different stages of their careers, early trainers, late trainers, and so forth, um, freight trainers. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> if you're interested in training, if you're interested in learning about training, if you're interested in participating in the show and being interviewed, drop me a line, and I would be delighted to speak to you. Uh, and before we start recording the show, we were talking a little bit about uh, WeChat payments. I was telling people about WeChat payments in China. Um, and it turns out that using WeChat payments in China is amazing and fun and terrific, but very difficult for foreigners to get into. Um, and so I actually have this long blog post describing how foreigners can use it, even if you don't have a Chinese phone number or a Chinese bank account. Um, and so if you're traveling to China, it is totally worth getting in on this. It is transformational and fascinating and you'll get all sorts of, oh, wow, you use that sort of payment as opposed to rolling eyes and, oh, my God, I have to deal with a caveman who uses cash. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I adore the title of this article, The Foreigner's Guide to WeChat Payments in China. <laughs> well, there you go. Wow, Kai, you are fast on finding things. I'm impressed. Um, literally a bot designed to find links. <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's an interesting little uh, LinkedIn blurb to put there. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks, guys, for an excellent discussion, as always. And thank you, dear listeners, for listening to us. And as always, if you have suggestions for what we can or should talk about or people to talk to, drop us a line, and we will be with you next week on The Freelancer Show. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.